lucky to have with us visiting again, Dr. Art Jenkins from New York City. Art, it's great to see you. We have lots of positive talk, and I hope this one is even more interesting. Thanks, Scott. Uh, glad to be here. It's, you know, as you know, it's a little bit of a uh, labor of love trying to raise the bar for this condition and patients who suffer from it. It is. And you know what? People like you are the people who will make a difference in this art. We're really thankful that uh, people who are forward thinking and uh, as smart as you are are working on these issues. Well, it, we all work together and, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. That's how we get there. <laughs> Good. I look forward to your talk. Please go ahead. Hi. So I'm Dr. Arthur Jenkins, uh, neurosurgeon, uh, spine specialist, uh, also have uh, become a little bit more active in the TOS uh, arena uh, through some of the other research and the other things that I've done and my collaborations with my vascular colleagues, uh, orthopedic colleagues, uh, physiatry colleagues, and even sometimes my uh, neurologists, radiologists. I mean, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a really big uh, family that takes care of patients like this and we all have to do our part. So uh, one of the things that I've had to manage and, and understand is when is it TOS and when is it not TOS? And sometimes even more complicated, when is it a little of both? Um, and it's and understanding that not everything is black and white and not everything that every pain that runs down your arm is TOS is important for the patients to understand. It's obviously important for the clinicians to understand, even important for the caregivers and families to understand that the patient may be dealing with a process and evolution of how to get to an ultimate treatment strategy that may not be a, a magic bullet or seeing a wave of the wand that gets you better, but it, it may be a process. And sometimes it's a process of picking off one problem before you even get to another problem. So understanding that it goes down the arm is TOS is, is step one. So whenever you give a talk, you always got to mention your conflict of interest. And I, I have no conflict of interest in the span. Hey, I'm a spine surgeon. I'm a neurosurgeon. I operate and generally try to get paid to do what I do. Um, so Keep that in mind as you're listening. But aside from that, I do what I do to try to help every single patient have the best possible outcome. So what is TOS? Before we start, I like to define the terms. It's a collection of diagnoses that cause pain and other problems that go down your arm. Uh, thoracic means chest area. Outlet means the area betwixt and between the, the spine and the arm itself. And syndrome just means stuff that goes wrong in it with the first two words. So the anatomy, uh, I know Scott's given great talks on this subject. Uh, in summary, you've got nerves, arteries, veins that run through some muscles and in between some bones on their way from the spine over the rib cage and then out the arm. Now, we as clinicians talk about symptoms or the problem or the pain that you notice. Because as a patient, you don't have symptoms if you don't have a problem. As far as you're concerned, everything works fine. You don't even think about it until it causes pain, tenderness, numbness, tingling, some problem, some deficit, some neurologic or, or physiologic problem in your life. Um, otherwise, it's not a symptom. Now, what I have found is I like to lump the, the TOS types into five categories. There are neurologic, venous, arterial, TOS in general. There are cervical ribs, and then there are pectoralis minor syndrome, each of which is a different. Cervical ribs are a congenital anomaly. And strange, many people don't get this, but congenital anomalies may not be symptomatic from birth, even though the anatomy was there since birth. Sometimes you kind of cruise along compensating until things get bad enough that they don't. So some patients don't develop symptoms until their teens, 20s, 30s, even 40s, that, or maybe the, the symptoms don't become lumped together in a way that makes the diagnosis until that age. 
but it's a very rare cause of true TOS symptoms. And that's where instead of having normal thoracic ribs, you actually have an extra rib coming off of your cervical spine and it pinches right up in this area up in here, it pinches the nerves uh, in this area. So that's a different type. And then finally, pectoralis minor syndrome is where these same structures run under this sling. They run between the shoulder blade and this little process coming off the shoulder blade. And then they run out the arm or back from the arm and they can get stuck in this sling and they can be compressed, they can be pinched. And most frequently they do so when the shoulder moves and that changes the position and puts it under tension. And the issue there that most frequently is as the arm goes up and the, the tension goes up, you wind up seeing the shoulder blade goes down. So it's almost, pin, it's almost scissoring the, the neurovascular bundle in between the arm going up and then the shoulder blade going down. So that's one of uh, the fifth major type TOS. Now, treatment of TOS is complicated enough. There are many different ways that we treat it surgically and non-surgically. There's injections, there's physiotherapy, bracing, uh, taping, hydrodissection, multiple different types of surgeries, each of which, each type has its own ideal surgery. But what if it's not TOS? Well, clearly you don't wanna treat something like a set joint, they can cause a disruption of the disc, they can cause cysts to develop in the spine itself. So it's important to look into signs and symptoms that maybe it's not TOS, maybe it's a cervical problem. Finally, spinal cord itself, and this can be caused by compression on the spinal cord, either at the same level where we were just talking, or even much higher or even much lower. There are uh, certain circumstances where the spine is tethered down below the area. It can cause problems higher up or Myelopathy is when a compression higher up causes neurologic to fun function uh, not well on the way down. Syringomyelia is a, a, a not uncommon cause where you just have a hole in the spinal cord that develops. It may be from trauma, it may be from something else that's in that area, or it might just happen on its own. Some kind of an intrinsic cord problem, any one of these things can cause weakness, pain, numbness, problems that sound an awful lot like TOS. So how do you figure this out? Well, usually the place to start, simple screening MRI. And if you see something abnormal there, you may want to dive a little deeper. You may want to get an MRI with contrast, EMGs, digital angiogram, CAT scans, even spec scan. There are many, many, many different tests one can get. And we'll get to towards the end, when you should get it. So the second major category is nerve entrapment in the periphery or downstream from the thoracic outlet in the arm itself. Um, and the three most common symptoms that overlap with TOS are cubital tunnel syndrome, where you have an impingement on the ulnar nerve in the elbow, carpal tunnel syndrome, where you might get impingement in the hand on the nerves that go to the hand at the wrist and radial palsy, which is the radial nerve. Those are the three main nerves, the median nerve, the ulnar nerve and the, the radial nerve that go into the hand itself. And obviously hand dysfunction is a common part of TOS and other things can make somebody think, maybe it's TOS, maybe it's not. So what helps diagnose these? A thorough physical exam is the first place to start. And actually a good history is always, and a medical history is not the same as going to your library and pulling out a history book. It's having the clinician ask what's going on and then ask very pointed questions. Does it hurt when you do this? Does it feel better when you do that? Tell me what makes it better, what makes it, so the, we'll get into that at the end. But, the history and the physical exam are very important to identifying. You know, were you, did you fall asleep on your arm in a way that maybe you pinched the nerve, the radial nerve in here? Were you a tennis player, a basketball player, a golfer, or some other, somebody maybe put a lot of strain on your elbow? 
Um, do you type a lot at the keyboard? Do you have a, a problem maybe in your, in your uh, carpal tunnel? And when all else fails, getting an MRI of the area in question or getting EMGs is a good place to identify where, if any, compression or dysfunction may be located in the arm itself. Now, obviously, the shoulder is a major part of the thoracic outlet uh, region. And so you can have separation. If you had trauma that was bad enough maybe to cause TOS-like symptoms, maybe it's because you actually damaged the shoulder joint. Maybe you fractured the clavicle, maybe falling off a bike or something like that. And maybe it didn't heal properly. Um, Sometimes, or it's not even the healing properly, maybe screws and, and plates put into the fracture line, maybe the screws went into or are pressing on the, uh, the bone, or maybe because it didn't heal, things moved. Tendinitis or pain in the shoulder area from an inflammation of the, the attachment of the muscle to the bone. Shoulder impingement syndrome, where maybe a problem in the shoulder is causing bone spurs or cysts to leak out and pinch the nerves, maybe not in the thoracic outlet, but in an area near the thoracic outlet. And rotor, the rotary cuff or rotator cuff injury, I love it when patients call it a rotary cuff, uh, that can also cause either similar symptoms be just because of the pain and where the pain goes, or it can actually irritate the nerve itself in the area. Once again, thorough history, thorough physical exam, x-rays of how the shoulders, clavicle, scapula are and how they move, looking, making sure things are where they belong and go where they're supposed to go. MRIs, EMGs, and you know what? A bone scan, which is a test where you inject a radioactive tracer into the bloodstream and look where it's picked up in the bones and joints, that will often selectively identify joints that are inflamed and may be a, a significant cause of pain. So there are tests that you can do to dive deeper into one of these problems, but we don't just order every test on every patient. I mean, who wants to get a nuclear isotope injected into their body if you don't actually need it? Tumors, scary word, it's out there. Um, Pancos tumor is where you actually have a primary lung tumor that pushes up into the area around the brachial plexus. And so they can mimic a brachial plexus problem. You wouldn't want to go for a first rib resection if you actually had a lung tumor. Um, spinal tumors can also cause pain and dysfunction. Tumors of the nerves themselves. So you don't want to take the pressure off the nerve if the problem is inside the nerve itself. And then there's a condition called paraneoplastic syndrome where you might have a tumor somewhere else in your body and it causes an immune reaction that attacks your own nerves themselves. Um, and there are, then we'll get to the other syndromes. Is it time to look into this? Oh my God, I've got TOS. Does that mean I have cancer? No, 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 no. This is once again, where you wanna make sure that you understand what's going on and the history and physical will be the key towards either taking this off the list or maybe moving it higher up on the list. Are there, is there a palpable mass? Can you feel a bump somewhere where a bump doesn't belong? Um, is there a, a, a shadow on the x-ray or is there a mass on an MRI that you've got for a different reason or maybe that was the reason you ordered? Is there cancer in your family? Is there cancer uh, in your children or in your parents? Is there exposure to cancer-causing agents, smoking, asbestos, things like that, mercury, uh, heavy metals? Um, very often, we'll start with a MRI without contrast, just to get a look at what's, what do things look like. We order contrast frequently when we're looking specifically for something called enhancement or whether or not something appears brighter when it doesn't belong there. We'll then order an MRI with contrast of either the chest or the brachial plexus, depending on what specifically we're looking for and what was present on the screening study. Or we may want to get a CAT scan just to look more at the bones than at the soft tissue in the area. 
Now, if you've gone through the first four categories and you still haven't found your, your likely target, we have to start thinking about some of the other rare, more syndromic or diffuse problems. Uh, complex regional pain syndrome or CRPS also used to be known uh, by a number of other uh, uh, subject, a no, number of other names, um, but um, it, we call it complex regional pain syndrome because it suggests that the problem in the nerves is more complicated than just a one-off problem, that this is a, a syndromic issue, and it involves the interactions of multiple nerves. Renaud is a process where the uh, blood vessels in the limb squeeze down because of abnormal signals uh, and you get less circulation in the arm uh, and it can mimic some of the findings we have in uh, either ATOS or even VTOS. Other medical syndromes that either are associated with TOS or can mimic TOS include Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, uh, Marfan's disease, both of those are hyperflexibility conditions um, vascular conditions, you know, uh, vascular steels. Uh, I just heard of a patient who has um, a, uh, she had symptoms very similar to TOS, uh, and many of them were made better by taking out the arteriovenous shunt she had for her dialysis. Um, and so she was had a, a vascular uh, steel phenomenon where blood was circulating through so fast she wasn't getting enough circulation in the arm and her arm had pain from that. Another one that's actually more common than we realize is called May Thurner, T-H-U-R-N-E-R, May Thurner syndrome. And that's a vascular problem that lives primarily in the pelvis. But somehow or other, and one of my colleagues, Dr. Wen Ting, has, uh, has discovered that Many patients he treats for vascular insufficiency in the pelvis have had TOS symptoms that get better on their own. And so there is some connection between the two. The opposite of hypermobility conditions like Ehlers-Danlos and Marfan's are sclerosing or arthritic stiffening conditions like ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, and osteoarthritis. These can cause pain, these can cause weakness, these can cause diffuse problems. And in some cases, they're an autoimmune process. And in others, there's a congenital predisposition to fusing joints, which then stiffens up the body. So if you suspect one of these possible causes for your pain and why you're in as much dysfunction as you are, the next step is to do, obviously, a thorough examination and history, but we may want to do diagnostic injections. Uh, we may want to be looking for hyperflexibility. If there's a significant suspicion of one of these, genetic testing is a good place to start, although we still don't have tests for every genetic condition. There are some types, for example, of Ehlers-Danlos that we can test for and some that we just can't. Um, when you have suspicion of a vascular problem, you want to look at what the anatomy of the blood vessels in the area are. So that may include ultrasound. It may include a uh, digital injection uh, arteriogram. It may include magnetic resonance angiography or computed tomography, CT angiography, which can give really great images of what the blood circulation is in an area and it may give us clues. Is it TOS? Is it not TOS? So we know from many, many years of doing this that TOS treatments are very specific to the underlying subtype or etiology of the TOS. So using the wrong treatment won't make you better. I mean, this is very specific. First rib resection won't help with pectoralis minor syndrome or cervical ribs. Thrombosis needs to be prophylaxed and possibly stented. Arterial TOS may require resection of an aneurysm, which if you don't take out the aneurysm, you don't fix the problem. And then if much of this comes from scapular instability, if you don't fix the scapula, many of these symptoms will still come back. So 
if you don't make the right diagnosis and it's not TOS, doing a TOS surgery won't make you better. And treating everything in that area like it's the same diet, you wouldn't treat a cervical disc herniation with a cancer chemotherapy. So you really have to find what's the right diagnosis. That's step one. So what do you as the patient need to do? Well, you need to be an aware patient and you have to be your own self advocate. And to do that, start by knowing your story. When did it start? How did it start? How has it changed over time? What makes it better? What makes it worse? And then where, what makes it better and worse in particular in terms of positions like lying down, sitting up, arms up, arms down. Um, are there times if I'm leaning forward or if I am, um, you know, lifting something? Are there anybody else in my family that has this condition? And are there any other problems? For example, let's say when I know, I know when I do this, that my fingers turn blue, or I know that when I get pain in my left arm, I eventually get pain in my right arm. Um, or maybe pain shoots up into my neck and up to my eyes. Um, so these are all things that if you notice them, write them down. Because what you do want to do is make sure that you have this concise and precise without exaggeration. Some patients feel like they have to, everything has to be a 12 out of 10 pain or nobody's going to take them seriously. And to be honest with you, doctors don't take patients seriously when they say they have 12 out of 10 pain. We know what 10 out of 10 pain means. That's as bad as it can get. Broken bone, childbirth. So when you tell me that your stubbed toe is a 12 out of 10 pain, I'm not taking you seriously, even though you think that exaggerating will make me think it's worse than it really is. So be a precise, be concise, and be realistic because you want your, when you have three to five minutes to talk to your primary doctor, because that's all they have before they have to get to their next patient, you want to present your story to them in a way that you set the hook and you hook them in so that they want to take the time to then do a thorough evaluation. I find that using medical jargon as a patient can be deceptive or even it can be incorrect. Um, many patients think that using more complicated words will make them be taken more seriously. But if you misuse it, it actually has the opposite effect. So just use simple descriptive words. It hurts here. It feels like it's burning. Don't say it's a radiculopathy. That's my job. My job as a neurosurgeon to identify radiculopathy. You, it's your job. Just say, this burns. This feels like an electrical sensation. This is numb. So that's the most effective way to communicate in both directions. If you've had scans, even going back 20 years, bring them. Nobody likes to go through a report if they know what they're looking at. And many times these things are missed. I can tell you horror stories of studies that missed major diagnoses in the report. Uh, and I can also tell you that many times radiologists will be afraid, Scott, sorry, um, they'll be more afraid of missing something. So they may overcall the significance of a particular radiograph, radiologic finding. It's there, but they want to make sure it comes to the attention of someone who can then say, it's there, but that's nothing. This is there and that's something. So if they don't know the patient, they just, they want to make sure everything gets noticed. So you want, I find the images themselves are more valuable than the report. So bring them, bring them all. And if you've had EMGs, if you've had evaluations by other doctors, bring it all. Let the doctor decide what's important. Don't you tell the doctor what's important. Let the doctor decide what's important but make sure that you have the time to do that. So make sure your physician takes that thorough history and does a thorough exam. If they don't, when you're trying to describe it to them and they don't seem to either have time or they're not taking it seriously, 
you can always ask for a second follow-up visit just for this one problem. And maybe they just don't have time because you were also talking about your sore throat and they were checking you for COVID. And then they were also checking you for TOS and they're checking you for, for lung cancer. That's too many things to try to address at one point. Just say, I, can, can I come back uh, you know, in a few days when you have a little bit more time just for this one problem? Or if they don't, can you get a, a specialist referral who will know the exam even better than the generalist and can actually take that time to dig deeper? And if the first you don't succeed, try and try again. And there are a lot of useful online support groups, but there's no peer review, meaning there's no overlord who's supervising the internet and takes out references that are wrong. There's nobody who's making sure, oh, don't go in that chat room. There's crazy people there, all right? There's no peer review. Peer review is what medical people call a, a, a battery of doctors who review an article before it's published. That doesn't happen on the internet. And believe me, there's a lot of cray cray out there. You don't want to fall victim to it. So you got to be a little, a little sophisticated in understanding when a group might be useful for you and when it might just be preying upon your fears. So there are some great groups out there. I'm not going to get into pointing fingers in a particular direction, but do your own due diligence. And there are trolls hiding out there. Ultimately, nobody knows you like you know you. But there are just too many test exams and imaging studies for one person to manage. And certainly for the generalist to want to order. I mean, there's no checklist that the generalists have where they say, oh, well, you got pain in your arm. We're going to order these 50 tests and you come back in six months when you've completed them all. The idea is get help, get somebody who can do, take the time to do a thorough history and physical, understand your rights. For example, some insurance companies will pay for a certain amount of things or they may not pay at all for uh, specialist care that's out of your network. So you've got to be prepared for what is covered, what isn't covered. You've got to be your own advocate. You got to know your rights. You got to know your coverage. You got to know what what's important to you and how hard you're willing to fight to get to where you need to be. Now, it's not always a fight. Sometimes you get to the doctor. The doctor says, "Oh, you got a cervical disc herniation. It's clear. Here's the evidence. Here's the imaging." I'm sending you to a specialist. It's great. Sometimes that's fantastic. Doesn't always work that way. And, and it's because these are complicated situations and we do our best to get it right eventually, but sometimes it's a an iterative process of trial and trial. I don't call it trial and error. I call it trial and trial, but you get the idea. So imaging is critical to identifying the specifics of where the problem is coming from but the history and physical, it's 90% of the game. It's Imaging is the difference between an A minus and an A plus in general in the workup, but you're not even gonna get the right imaging if you don't have a good history and physical by your clinician to point you in the right direction. And that's where you having a concise history to give to them will make their job easier. And so we don't want to just order every test on every patient because all these tests carry risks. They all carry expenses. And some of them, the risks are not insignificant. Radiation exposure is a lifetime risk for getting cancer. Um, MRIs are, you know, some people get very claustrophobic in them, you know, and it's a big, complicated machine. You know, there's a lot going on. And so we don't want to just order every test on every patient. We don't want to just spin the roulette wheel and hope we get the right answer. I'm going to leave you with this little mantra that I, that I have and I use. A man with one watch knows what time it is. A man with two watches is never sure. So my spin on this is the wise man figures out which watch tells the best time and they wear that one. And whatever gender term you want to put in there, feel free to substitute. I want to thank you for your interest. I want to thank you for, uh, obviously, I want to thank my colleagues uh, in all the different specialties who help have taught me many things. 
that we are learning and going through this process together, that we care for our patients together as a team. Um, and of course, I want to thank the TOS Education uh, Group for giving me this platform to address uh, this issue, which is a very complicated and very um, multifaceted uh, diagnosis. Um, this, is, this is what we call the differential diagnosis talk. We're trying to differentiate one problem from another. Um, I'll also leave you with this concept that sometimes patients have more than one condition and sometimes they have both TOS and one of the other big fives or more. There's, I mean, there's no law that says you can't have three or four different diagnoses at once and many of my patients do. Once again, thank you for your interest and time. And I think uh, now's a good time to take some questions and see where this goes. Art, that was uh, great as usual. It's a topic we don't talk about a lot here because we're always focused on TOS, but obviously patients don't come in with that diagnosis in most cases. So I think it was great to focus on so many other things. Um, I wanna make a couple quick comments before we take some questions. One is I want to emphasize what you said. Uh, when a radiologist reads a study, he or she is best when they're working with somebody like you. You're referring a patient with a specific question in mind, and a radiologist shouldn't just list a bunch of things that are normal or abnormal, but should try to answer your question. And in my opinion, this is particularly important in TOS, which is such a hard disease to get our hands around in many cases. Do you have any comments on that? Oh, absolutely. It's the old saying, if a picture is worth a thousand words, why do I get an MRI back from some places and there's only 200 words for 200 images? I mean, it's, they, you know, when you give me a, a TOS uh, MRI evaluation, it's several pages long and it details measurements, relative positions of, uh, you know, one bone to another, you know, what the width of a canal is and, and you know, where, where things are going. And, but that's also partly because you have taken a lot of time and energy to speak the clinician language to understand what the issues are and really understand what am I looking for? Um, you know, there's, um, that, that's why we pick your, we pick your brain a lot. Uh, you know, we're always well, asking those, docs like you, you know, you're particularly great at this stuff, but I'm always picking your brain. So we know what our next step is. We know we're not perfect. Right. How do we get, as better? I said, it's an iterative process. We learn, we implement, we try it, we learn what didn't work, we learn something new, we then implement it. And so it's just an iterative process of every day getting one step higher on the ladder towards global enlightenment in a medical environment. And you've emphasized the point that a clinician needs to get this diagnosis first, at least suspect it before they order imaging or the imaging is Correct. essentially useless by itself. So Correct. I, I hope we emphasize that point for all our patients. Yeah. Um, I think Herb has a couple of questions from patients coming in now before I ask further. So what is the most common of the five categories you listed that you see that you get confused with TOS in your patients? Uh, probably most common, it would be carpal tunnel because that's one of the most common conditions out there. Uh, it's more common than even disc herniations, but I would say disc herniations are more commonly confused with TOS. Um, so it's they're a little bit different. It depends on how you phrase the question and how you want the emphasis on the question you want it to be. Uh, for example, uh, there's a lot of times that I have patients come to me and they have really sounds like they got pain running down their arm. It's worse when they lift up their hand. But when I actually do a thorough exam and I, I, I poke and prod in their chest area, I can't reproduce the symptoms. But if I can reproduce at the elbow, it's called cubital tunnel syndrome, and that's not TOS. Um, so there are a number of things, and like the ones that are really tricky often get missed. And if the person, I, I can just tell you that there's a, a whole... Uh, I don't want to use uh, uh, the wrong terminology or the wrong metaphor, but there's a lot of people who have had surgeries for a condition that they had a minor radiologic finding for, but that radiologic finding wasn't causing their symptoms. 
Uh, and a discectomy infusion is one of the most common of those. The failed operation for a TOS problem that was misdiagnosed as a cervical radiculopathy from a disc herniation, which may have been the tiniest of disc herniations that would have been asymptomatic and would never have been touched if they didn't also have TOS. It's a great point. Clinician will see a patient with a radiculopathy, possibly a polyradiculopathy, and they'll see a report from a, an MRI from a radiologist who's just busting through a bunch of films, and it says herniation. So there's something wrong, and they go for it. And then the patient yep. ends up needing another diagnosis. Right. At, so, at, at best case scenario, they just need the right diagnosis. Worst case scenario, they might have a complication from the surgery that they maybe didn't even need in the first place. Unfortunately. Uh, and, and every specialty has that category. Uh, you know, there's, it, it, clin I will just say clinicians are doing their best. And so the key is you want to want to make sure you get the best care you can. How often do you see, this is something we discuss for our viewers, how often do you see a multiple crush syndrome where someone might show up looking like carpal tunnel, but you find subtle findings more proximal? Oh, a, a lot. I mean, I would say at least a third, if not 50% of patients have what I would call multiple areas of compression. Um, and that's where it gets complicated because what do you treat first? Um, and my general philosophy has always been I treat either the most upstream problem first mm -hmm. or I treat the problem that looks like it's the biggest, most imminent cause of a potentially permanent neurologic problem. So, um, you know, somebody might have a, a minor nerve impingement in their neck. It's not pushing on the spinal cord. It's, it's probably not causing weakness but they've got a really bad crush in their, in their thoracic outlet, I'll probably do the thoracic outlet first. But now turn it around, they've got a big disc herniation in their neck and it's actually pushing on their spinal cord, that's gotta go first. Yep. So for our viewers, just so they understand, can you explain what multiple crush is and why you've just explained everything you did? Well, the, the multiple crush is that nerves are a complicated structure that they're not just a tube and they're not just a wire uh, similar to what you'd have, you know, in your house running, you know, your electrical conduit. Uh, and the nerves signals need to be conducted along this, this chemical, electrochemical pathway. And what we have found is that if you have a problem, if you have a, an external compression in multiple places, the damage to your neurologic function, to the actually how well the nerve works at the end in the muscles, is synergistically made much worse. It's almost ex exponentially worse with each additional point of compression. Um, so patients with, say, cervical and lumbar spinal stenosis, sometimes we fix the cervical stenosis and the lumbar just feels better. And so it's just that... It, you want to typically take either the most proximal, most upstream closest to the brain, or the worst out, and very often the other will feel better. Um, and But it, the complexity there is being able to identify and understand, well, which one is worse? Is it the carpal tunnel? Is it the brachial plexus TOS? Is it the cervical arthritis and, and spinal stenosis? Is it myelopathy? Or God forbid, what if it's a brain problem and it's we're totally off on all of this? So you, you really got to be able to differentiate all of these. And it takes time and it takes a thorough exam and it takes a thorough history. A good exam. You, you have, a, am sure, a very organized neuro exam for every patient. We try. Yeah. And then do you want to discuss briefly for our viewers the difference between having a sensory neuropathy and a motor neuropathy, if you would? Sure. Well, I mean, sensory meaning feel. And so that is something from out there that you come in contact with and you irritates or, or identify these on your skin somewhere. Um, and then that signal travels through the nervous system up through your spinal cord to the brain. So that's the sensory loop. And then the typical thinking of the standard reflex of, you know, you step on a tack, you feel the tack in your foot signal goes to your brain your brain says ouch and then it sends this motor signal back down to the foot you lift your foot up 
Okay, it's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be pushing on this sharp object that's causing <laughs> ouch. So the motor part is the signals going down. And they actually have uh, very different uh, signal characteristics. And you can have a problem in one and not the other. Uh, for example, ALS affects motor neurons. Uh, diabetic neuropathy affects mostly sensory neurons. Um, and so different problems can manifest in different ways. Um, and so it's important to understand when something is affecting one and the other. We will often be more motivated to try to dive into a motor problem because motor problems tend to have permanent damage earlier than sensory problems. Numbness has a better chance of recovering than weakness does, in other words. And so motor problems are the things that leave you paralyzed. Sensory problems are the things that leave you not feeling things as well. Um, and most people would agree they'd really not want to be paralyzed if they could avoid it. Right. Good point. And the, the original controversy of TOS came up because uh, Wilborn said he would only accept true neurogenic TOS when there was atrophy in the hand muscles. And right. And that's too late. Yeah. And that's too late. Why would you wait? I mean, literally, that's like saying, well, you know, this Christopher Reeve guy, he's paralyzed. Um, but let's wait until his muscles waste away before we decide whether we want to treat him or not. Right. No, no, no. If there were a problem and you could fix it right away and reverse it, that's the time to intervene. Don't make the diagnosis. You know, it's the old uh, the, it's an old joke about, you know, uh, four doctors are floating around in a, in a duck blind going hunting. And the, the punchline, I'll get to the punchline. The punchline of the joke is the ducks fly over the pathologist and the surgeon. The surgeon whips out his shotgun, shoots up in the air and says, go tell me if one of them was a duck. <laughs> You know, don't just find out if it was a duck, but listen, see, hear. Do I hear a duck coming first? There's more than one type of duck. They're correct. So, yeah, and so that's that's one of my pet peeves about this for the people who um, bring up the category of disputed TOS. It's like they're waiting until yeah. it gets to the end stage before they're willing to make the diagnosis, and that's, that's bad for patients. So, yeah. you know, some of our viewers well, and some of the people we deal with have waited years and gone through many doctors because they haven't found somebody like you. And that's just I don't know how often you see that. How often are you the fourth or fifth doctor in line with a TOS oh, patient? Quite frequently. And I still have that discussion with some of my neurologists uh, out here. There is hope, though, because we have discovered that there uh, there are some tests that may be earlier than EMGs. EMGs are a terrible test, test for TOS because it only tests really if there's significant permanent weakness. Intermittent weakness doesn't show up on an EMG, but, but continuous or more permanent weakness does. Whereas uh, motor evoked potentials and somatosensory evoked potentials can be done on patients before they've had surgery, even when they're not asleep on the table. It is painful but it actually, if, if it tells us you have TOS, it can refute this concept that, well, if it doesn't show up on electrophysiology, it ain't real. And, and unfortunately, that, that, uh, the irony is, is that article was published back in the 80s, and it was, based, it was really a response to complication rates among mm -hmm. vascular surgeons doing these procedures 40 years ago. So just to I mean, clarify, we, we're talking about the paper that Asa Wilborn wrote, making yes. the neurogenic TOS disputed. Correct. Correct. Creating that concept that that if it doesn't have EMG finding, it's disputed TOS. Yeah. And once you call something disputed, you've completely undermined anybody's credibility in, in describing it. Oh, it's disputed TOS. Well, there was he, he used no evidence to say that this, there was a dispute about this. He was just saying, don't operate on these patients. Well, he didn't do it in the right way, unfortunately, because I find that a lot of neurologists to this day, more than any other type of doc, tend to roll their eyes at the diagnosis of TOS, and that's just so unfortunate. Exactly. That's his legacy. So very powerful legacy, and it's not one to be underestimated, but uh, yeah. just like we see fake news in the, in the, uh, in the political arena, there's, uh, there are fake diagnoses in the medical arena. And, and that will segue into the next part. You may get a lot of patients who have been on Facebook or some other public forums with non-medical people. 
And um, what do you think are the, I know you warned people, be careful because it's not peer reviewed, but do you think there's value for those patients to go to, to shake it around with other people? I, I think there is value, but I think you also have to understand there's, there's safety in numbers and then there's a mob mentality. And it's very easy to go rapidly from one to the other. Um, and so, it, and it's often hard to figure out whether you're following a crowd to some great new event or like a lemming going off a cliff. Um, and so I, I have been a party, uh, I've, I've been an invited member of a couple of different uh, Facebook groups, for example. And, you know, I will say that there is a, there is a whole spectrum of behaviors on these. Uh, some are far more bullying than others and some are, um, you know, there's a lot of people who think they know more than they do. And then there are a lot of people just desperate for knowledge who are looking for someone to be a beacon of, of information for them. And then there, there are people who have had valuable experiences that they're trying to share. And, and the real difference is trying to identify who is whom. Um, and I'm, I'm reminded of that old New Yorker cartoon of, you know, the two dogs standing in front of a laptop and the one saying to the other on the Internet, no one knows you're a dog. <laughs> That's great. So figuring out who is who, it's really critical. Well, it's it's like figuring out which clinicians know what they're talking about, and which ones don't. It's not right. easy. Right. And, you know, in those groups, they will have their favorite doctors and they'll have people go see Dr. So-and-so, go see Dr. So-and-so. We yeah. like him or we like her. Now, right. there's some value in that because a lot of patients have had experience with Dr. X or Dr. Y. But on the other hand, when they criticize a doc, um, they may not know what they're talking about. You know, some docs have bad outcomes. It's a difficult disease. You may treat a patient. They may not get much better. Does that right. mean someone should go online and say, Dr. Z just was terrible. I didn't like him. You know, we right. all know people like to complain. So, yeah, no, um, it's definitely that mob mentality, and the mob can turn on anybody at any yeah. time. Yeah, so um, you've got to take it with a grain of salt. And yep. Yeah, so like you said, advocate for yourself. Read online, get some of the basic facts. Don't try to be a, a doctor. Be a little bit skeptical about what you read online, especially in support groups. Mm -hmm. You're desperate. But there's also no limit to what people will do to take advantage of it to somebody in a desperate situation. Yep, yep, and they yep. may not even realize they're taking it and they may think they're trying to help, but because mm -hmm. they have a particular bent and they're pushing really hard, what they think is the right thing to do for, for somebody or for everybody. Um, you know, it's, it's easy for a message to get uh, twisted or it's also very easy for even someone like me, uh, you know, the crowd could turn on me in a heartbeat and, you know, I might, disappear from the internet for two years because, you know, there's bullies out there that I just don't have the energy to deflect a thousand different arrows coming from, you know, different directions. So every time you go on the internet, you take a risk. While we're on that subject, what's the best way for patients who view this to reach you? Um, go to my website. Uh, we have a process for uh, requesting free consultations. Uh, or deciding whether or not a, a direct consultation with me is appropriate. We do telemedicine. Um, I have a multidisciplinary practice for managing uh, spine patients, both surgically and non-surgically. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's plenty of inf both information there and a, a way to reach out to us uh, to, get, uh, to get a little bit closer. And you can see the question at the bottom, where are you located and do you do telehealth appointments by Dina in Houston? So Dina in Houston, hello. Uh, we do telemedicine uh, and we also, uh, but we are located in uh, New York City and in Connecticut. Uh, both of which are close to major transit centers if coming to us is an issue. If coming to us isn't an issue, we can certainly discuss things with you, um, but we don't have a network. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a referral source for other people because I, if I haven't operated with them, I don't know if they're good or not. So all I can tell you is what I know and what I think, um, you know, these telemedicine consults, they aren't what I would consider real medical advice because unless I can see you, unless I can lay my hands on you, unless I can put you through my paces in, in a way that really 
I haven't been able to identify a good way of doing that in a virtual environment. I can do some simple things, but simple isn't thorough and I like to be thorough. So it's not really medical advice. It's general hypothetical advice in a telemedicine environment. Do you feel you can do a good job of triaging people to the next step though? I do. Situation? I think I think in general, I have a pretty good idea because as I said, the history of physical is 90% of it. And if I can do half of the physical exam, I can at least have a 70% chance of getting you to the right place with a telemedicine type of environment. And then, you know, we'll take it from there. Some people would even say 80% just on history alone. All right. Next question. I watched your earlier talk about why TOS is so hard to diagnose. Is there a specialist, I presume a type of specialist, that is best to begin with by, from Dana and Yuma? Um, I, I can't say yes or no. I would say, you know, find one who's compassionate and will listen to you. Um, it might be a physiatrist. It might be a chiropractor. It might be a, your generalist. It, it might be your OBGYN who just happens to also have experience in this area. Uh, it really, it's whoever's going to take the time to listen and point you in the next right direction. And I might add here, what, what Dr. Jenkins is getting at is there is no specialist that owns TOS. Uh, there is no institution. I've found that, you know, great places like Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, Stanford, th there's different ranges of TOS expertise. So you can't just go to the place that U.S. News and Health says is the best heart treatment place, which I think is Cleveland Clinic for the past 20 years. But right. you really need to find your own TOS specialist. That. I understand is hard for patients. That's where sometimes yeah. the social media can help, but contact us, our website. We're happy to help steer you to people in your area and uh, help you get those connections uh, with our contact info. And, you know, you can ask around of, of other TOS patients. Um, it, it's not one specialist. It's not one type. Okay. Next question from Buddy Lee and me, uh, Dr. Jenkins, I've been diagnosed via MRI with TOS in January. I've been getting good results with a new chiropractor, but also have long-time injuries to several thoracic bodies, lots of chronic numbness in the toes. Do you have thoughts? Uh, yeah, I would certainly say you probably need to make sure those uh, the toes probably aren't coming from the TOS. Um, I would say they're probably coming from the thoracic if nothing else is going on in the lumbar. Um, it's just, these are all complicated. There's no, there's no one right answer. And I, you know, I might examine you and say, you know what, you may have problems in your thoracic, but it's not coming from the thoracic. We got to look lower, or I may look at you and do some tests and say, your problem's not even in the thoracic or lumbar. It's up in your cervical spine. Or I may look at you and say, Hey, you got gout, you know, that's the, or you've got peripheral neuropathy from diabetes. I, I don't know. It's, um, the, you know, the human body is a very complicated organ. Um, the whole thing together is not just one unit, but it's the sum of all of our parts. So it could be just about anything. The, um, the person who's getting treated and feeling better from a chiropractor, that's interesting. Do you see any decent per, uh, percentage of patients with TOS who also have lower extremity symptoms? You had mentioned May Turner, May Thurn. Sure. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. And, and unfortunately patients who get, get injured badly enough to have a TOS problem can also have back problems and they could also have, you know, herniated discs. They can also have other congenital anomalies and, you know, where they might have a bad knee, you know, so there's definitely, um, you know, you got to look at the whole picture. Uh, next question, mud in truck and hunting. That sounds like fun. What's the relationship between CRPS and TOS? I've heard a good amount of people with TOS end up with CRPS after rib resection. This is a good question. Um, I think that they, there are, sometimes it's a causal link. There may be some patients who have, get CRPS after the surgery. If the surgery causes compression during, while they're doing the resection, they can damage the brachial plexus and cause CRPS. You can also get CRPS from chronic compression and maybe because you didn't get the rib resection soon enough, the CRPS sets in. Um, so it, it's the answer is yes, there can be an association and it can be because of the surgery that was done or it can be because the surgery wasn't done soon enough. 
Thank you. And there are a couple types of CRPS, one of which, which is caused by nerve injury. The other is unrelated. So right. you, you already kind of mentioned that. Um, we have a question from a Marion here. I don't know if that's going to show up. Uh, I wanted to ask you quickly about pectoralis minor syndrome. In a lot of the TOS literature, it's just another tunnel where the nerves are compressed, but you did not approach it that way. You talked about the complex motion of the scapula and you talked about tension on the plexus. Do you want to address that a little bit? Well, I think that the, one of the things that I found um, in my, as I've been going through this process is that m much of TOS is, is, come, is secondary to that scapular instability. Uh, what happens, the scapula changes position depending upon where the arm is located. And the scapula is the primary driver of the position of the clavicle. And the clavicle may be the it may be the the item that causes compression on some parts of the of the the NTOS, for example, but it's almost like it's an innocent bystander. It was pushed into place because of the scapula is in the wrong place, um, and it's almost like you know the car that hits yours may have been hit by the truck behind it, but you turn around and you see the car hitting you. That's what you who you're mad at. Um, and so it, it's as far as the, the, the scapular position, I mean, and as a direct cause of the, uh, the, the um, pec minor syndrome, but also in many of the other types of, of TOS as well, uh, it's, it can't be understated at the importance of understanding. And that's actually why some patients, whether it's with this chiropractor or with, uh, I've had some people say they have great results with doing shoulder shrugs to try to elevate the scapula which helps pull the clavicle up off of the, the, the rib cage a little bit. Uh, these are all great uh, things and they all help stabilize the scapula. But it's also why some exercises exacerbate TOS because if you're not, if you're doing things that pull the shoulder blade back forward, sometimes that will actually cause the, the, the scapula. And sometimes even some of the retraction will pull the scapula back, but it'll drag the, the clavicle tighter against the rib cage, pinching the nerves even more. And so you really have to know which exercises to do, which ones not to do. Um, and it all comes back to that scapular position in TOS. Um, it's not the not TOS talk as much as it is the TOS talk. Um, and, and I actually believe that 10, 20 years from now, we'll be doing TOS surgery completely differently, mm. where we'll actually be repositioning and remobilizing the scapula. But we just, we don't have the biomechanics yet to do that. It's a great, great description of it. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. The scapula is a driver. That's great. Uh, the same gentleman, I presume it's a gentleman who asked us uh, a question before as a follow-up. You, you never know. I know plenty of women who hunt and like their trucks. So. Yep. So that's my disclaimer. I apologize. Uh, what are your thoughts of doctors saying that a scalenotomy is suggested for neurogenic TOS instead of a rib resection? I would say it depends on the problem. Uh, I have some patients who have purely scaling compression on the TO on the uh, on the neurovascular bundle and the brachial plexus. I have some patients who have purely first rib compression. I have some patients who have both. Um, so I think the answer is it should never be all one, all the other, but I think it has to be you tailor the treatment to the patient's specific anatomy. And that, once again, goes back to thorough history, thorough physical exam. And, and I would like to add at this point that uh, from my study of the history of TOS, there have been many, many different types of TOS. There isn't one type. Some of them are caused by muscle anomalies. Some of them are Correct. caused by the compression between the bone there's a whole series of things that goes on here. This sure. is why we're so proud of our MRI and working with people like Dr. J and other experts around the country that we are learning slowly but surely to deconstruct those underlying processes. So if you've had a good MRI and you have compression by the scalene and not by the rib and the clavicle, that is an option. And that's something that your doc should be able to discuss with the radiologist, hopefully, and get that narrowed down. And sometimes even just doing Botox to the scaling may give you relief that right. may not even require surgery. So there, there's a whole, you know, and there are people who are doing, um, you know, uh, 
nerve flossing, trying to free up the scaling muscle a little bit. There's mm -hmm. people trying to do things to make the, uh, the scaling less inflamed. It, it, there, there are multiple stages uh, in this diagnosis. And so it gets back to the idea of make the right diagnosis first come right. up with the treatment second based on what the right diagnosis is. So mud and truck and hunt, uh, miss or mister, if your doc has made a good clinical diagnosis and he or she is working with a good radiologist and it's a problem in the scaling, then you have these other options Dr. J is talking about, like uh, nerve gliding, like injections into the muscle to relax it. And if you want to contact us through our website, tosmri.com, we're glad to help point you in the right direction. Um, along the path of what you were just saying, Art, Stephen, uh, who we know, uh, if scapular stability is an issue, how can it be improved? Well, that gets back to what we were just saying. There are, there are people who are doing bracing. There are people doing taping. There are exercises specifically to try to stabilize the and elevate the scapula. Uh, those are all great uh, temporizing things, but it's a lot like, you know, if you've got a dent in your car, you can pull the dent out. If you if the car is completely totaled, fixing the dent isn't going to make it better. So it, a lot of times it depends on where you are in the, the treatment and you know and how early you intervene uh, with the, the diagnosis, uh, whether or not non-surgical interventions are going to be helpful. Um, and I always recommend you try to exhaust a non-surgical reasonably before you go to surgery. You know, if, if you're doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome, that's one definition of insanity. But by the same token, if you haven't tried these, inter these things, don't dive into surgery until you've at least given something an opportunity to avoid surgery. And something I've, I've always said, just like Dr. Jenkins is an expert at what he does, um, physical therapists are not all the same. You wouldn't see a general practitioner or a surgeon that does a ton of appendectomies for TOS. For a physical therapist, you don't want to just see somebody who says, yeah, I read about TOS back in training. You want to see somebody who knows TOS, who works with a doctor like Dr. Jenkins, yeah. somebody who's good at TOS. Uh, and they will very often work a lot on breathing, scapular repositioning, posture. It's, it's a part of the structure. So that's a, Stephen, that's a great question. I know we had a question from Marion. Uh, also, I want to remind all our viewers, none of this is specific medical advice. We can't give you advice like this over the internet. We want you to be cautious with what we tell you. It's general educational purposes. So I'd just like to remind everybody of that every few minutes. Um, did we have, okay, so I'll go to this question first. Ngaku, uh, how often is bilateral surgery required for TOS? I had surgery on the left side, but now my right side has many symptoms. This is a good question too. I would I would say it's realistically it's about ten percent of the time that you wind up getting surgery on both sides, and it's not unusual for patients. Maybe they had minor symptoms on one side and major symptoms on the other, and then the symptom it just it happens. And sometimes it happens as a result of the rehab. You start working the other one while the first mm -hmm. side is recovering, and then that aggravates the other side. Um, and there may be other subtle neurovascular reflexes that go on where you fix one side, the other side suddenly becomes symptomatic, kind of like it feels like whack-a-mole. You fix one and another one comes up. So the, these are, it's definitely happens, but it's right now, in my experience, it's about 10% of the time you wind up doing both. But we've done it. Um, and so it's just, uh, you know, you, you hope that you don't have to, but, uh, and you certainly do your best to rehab it. Um, and if it's just getting worse and you, you know, push comes to shove and you just can't keep going on like you are, then, yeah, do the other side. So it, it's pretty common that patients with minor symptoms or no symptoms on the contralateral side all of a sudden develop the TOS symptoms in your experience. It's common enough that it's a thing. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, well, I have a series of questions, very uh, long involved questions. I'm going to read them without posting them here by a, a, a person named Ghost and Bell who's having a lot of uh, symptoms and problems. I'm just going to read through some of them. Uh, again, with a disclaimer, we can't make a specific medical diagnosis uh, or suggest treatment. So um, I'll read a few of them here, Art, if I could. Uh, I can't get proper help or respect or listening. My MRIs are getting denied, but they want to jam metal in C6 and C7 without understanding why I've had blood clots and eye stroke, eye 
stroke and a giant lump and constant pain. Uh, after getting kicked out of hospitals because they don't listen, I got an MRI showing C6, C7 herniation. The nurses are giving me pieces of paper saying it's CRPS or thoracic outlet syndrome, impingement syndrome. Uh, why is this so common and yet it's a mystery? Come on. Uh, why do vascular doctors not think a giant lump under my arm is not an issue? Uh, why do I have blood clots and an eye stroke? Um, so, so he has a lot of questions and it sounds uh, to me pretty terrible. He's, it sounds like without knowing the details, this uh, guy or gal has been through a, a ton and is in this cycle of doctors not finding anything and not listening. Um, do we have general advice on how to get him narrowed or her narrowed down to a, a good position here? Uh, yeah, that's a, it's a really a tough one because there's there's obviously a lot of different symptoms going on, and and honestly, some doctors are like people, like in, in any other aspect of life, they could be overwhelmed by the complexity of what your symptoms are, uh, understanding the complex interactions of strokes. Uh, you know, maybe there's a, a factor deficiency that's leading you to be more likely to have strokes. Maybe there's um, you know, maybe there's a disc bulge, or maybe it's not a real herniation, or maybe this is really a big disc herniation that is a big problem and you have TOS, or maybe it's a disc herniation and it's appearing to be TOS. I, I obviously, this is a really complicated story. I've heard very similar ones. Um, it's not unusual for patients with conditions like Ehlers-Danlos. Uh, and other complex neurologic conditions like that to have uh, multiple symptoms, multiple conditions, uh, and um, you know, it, it, and that in and of itself has multiple interactions with other syndromes, vascular uh, and neurologic. It's it's a and it makes it very hard because then the other side of that coin is traditionally patients with Ehlers-Danlos don't recover as well from surgeries as patients who don't have Ehlers-Danlos. And it's important to know that going in, that the bar on how you'll do after the surgery may be lower. And you have to be willing to have that surgery, knowing that you're at higher risks of complications and potentially mm -hmm. less benefit from the surgery from mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't have Ehlers-Danlos. You don't want to be caught on unawares and you go through this incredibly complicated surgery and you're just not as good as you were hoping to be because the Ehlers-Danlos really is a separate layer upon the diagnosis that's making everything more difficult. And while uh, strokes can definitely be a presenting symptom of TOS, it's somewhat unusual. Uh, hard for us to know what a lump under the arm is, but certainly could that be an aneurysm or could that be a soft tissue mass? Aneurysm could be a hematoma, it could be any one of yeah. a number of different yeah. things. And so it's, as you said, really hard to figure out what it is. Um, and you just need someone who can take the time and piece through part by part and identify what is relevant, what isn't relevant, and what the next steps are in the workup trail. So, so when you're stuck with all these symptoms and all these connections with different doctors, I think what like our, what Dr. Jenkins said before, if you have too many symptoms and too many problems, a doc is going to throw up his or her hands and say, I, I can't figure it out because they're frustrated, as sounds like you are. So maybe narrow down what's the most important right now and take one doctor who's your quarterback, maybe your primary care doc, who can get all the info from your specialist and ask them to commit to at least one of these problems to start on that pathway. Um, you know, or, people... or you may need a specialist for each of them and yeah. just have your primary doctor do nothing but act as the quarterback, you know, hand the ball off here, pass the ball there, do you, but be the central repository of the whole yeah. workup. I mean, good way to put it. it it's it, it certainly sounds complicated, but I think the most important thing is to not, is to recognize that it's not just complicated for you, but it's probably complicated for the doctors, too. Hmm. Um, you know, medicine is, is um, I don't want to say it's poisoned, but I will say it is, it is biased by what's been known for thousands of years as Occam's razor, which is that you always try to simplify any diagnosis down to one unifying condition. 
and it's not always true. Sometimes it's the easiest have, way, though. But the easiest but way. We, what we try to do is we try to put everything into and, and narrow it down to the tree to one single trunk, mm -hmm. and then hope everything is just a branch off that one trunk. But sometimes you have more than one tree in your backyard. And sometimes it's not, you can't just prune everything back to one single trunk. And so Occam's razor doesn't apply to every patient. Or sometimes we haven't found the main trunk yet. Maybe there is, there is a condition that hasn't been diagnosed yet that is all of those things that, the, that this person described. And we, we don't have a name for it. And maybe we'll call it ghost syndrome. All right. So ghost, uh, try to utilize your primary care doc. Try to narrow down to focus on one issue first. See if you can isolate that enough to move the diagnosis forward. Uh, Occam's razor and, means and, there's one answer be, for everything, but you know what? There are complex conditions that there's not just one answer. But and, be patient. and be, be patient. You have now. to be the patient, but ultimately that means you have to exhibit patience. And sometimes you have to be aware that not every step is a step in the right direction, but sometimes yeah. taking that step will at least reveal what's in that direction. And maybe, you know, now you step back and go in a different direction. We hope that's a helpful start. It sounds like there's a lot going on. Good luck. Um, Mud in Truck and Hunting has another question. Uh, sorry, I had one more. I had great relief from a local anesthetic injection in my left scaling muscle, but the Botox injection did not work. Why could this be? Wow. Um, a, maybe they injected into a different place. B, maybe just the Botox. Maybe the problem isn't the tension on the boat on the muscle, but just it's the Botox didn't relax it enough to make it uh, the problem go away. Um, Maybe the anesthetic happens. was injected around the nerve roots themselves, meaning it wasn't any mechanism of the scaling. Um, it, it does. There, there does are a lot of reasons, and and it, it doesn't <laughs> negate the value that the injection gave us. I mean, it sounds like that's a problem. So. You know, I would certainly try to to direct my treatments in that area going forward. Uh, Herb, did we have, let's see, there were some more questions here. I know we had Marion and we haven't gotten to her because we went down a different pathway. Do we still have her questions available? And if not, let's see. Ah, there we go, Marion. And sorry for the delays. Um, Mine wasn't really a question, more of a comment regarding not getting surgery before total atrophy of the hands and arms. Uh, my uh, daughter yeah, had, there's the first part of it here. So we got it reverse order, I'm sorry. My daughter had a vascular surgeon tell her to come back when she was totally disabled. We obviously found another okay. surgeon who did do bilateral first rib resection. Yeah, that's an apocryphal story. Uh, but that goes back to being the patient advocate. If somebody tells you something that doesn't make sense, it goes back to my concept. Don't wait until the car is wrecked before doing maintenance on it. You know, it's like if you hear the engine is starting to see the engines overheating and you're hearing a whine coming from the engine, don't wait till it stops running on I-95. Take it to the dealer, get it serviced, get, you know, put, put some radiator fluid in it before it overheats, <laughs> you know? Don't wait until the whole thing falls apart and then say, well, gee, now there's nothing we can do. Um, you know, fix it early. That's that's always been my philosophy. Uh, you, you remind me of a story just off the side years ago. There was um, a, a girlfriend of mine had a very close friend and her family was fairly wealthy. Her, her dad always bought her new cars. And one day her boyfriend uh, lifted the hood to check her oil and she was shocked. She's like, what what are you doing? <laughs> so, you know, the car's got 12,000 miles on it. You've never changed the oil. So, yeah, maintenance is part of it. Now, I, I certainly hope your daughter uh, has done well with those rib resections. Um, obviously, we don't believe in waiting until somebody's disabled. Uh, what we were talking about before with waiting for atrophy yeah, that, of any muscle. In, that that in goes this. back to disputed TOS. Don't wait until it's not disputed, yeah. but devastated. Fix it before it becomes yeah. a problem. And we, I don't call it disputed TOS. I just call it NTOS. Yeah, that's been one of the one of the issues that I've had to deal with a lot. The doctors who just feel it's okay to ignore TOS 
or feel they don't need to know much about it. It's hard to yeah. learn. It's complex. But there's no excuse for this not to even try to learn it because you read in one article, it wasn't even a scientific article, that it's disputed. That's unfair to a lot of patients. So yeah. sorry that your daughter went through this. Um, uh, let's see. So Marion actually said in the comments here that her daughter is better, not 100%, but definitely improved. That's good to hear. And um, she's 23 and told to stop lifting her arms and come back when you can't use them. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, Mar Mary, so, I'm sorry. I would not, that. that's advice I would not take. Okay. Uh, Herb, do we have other questions here? Or I can ask one or two more for Dr. Jenkins. Um, this is our promotional thing for TOSeducation.org. Fareed Gargoslu is a robotic surgeon using robotics for TOS. Got a fascinating story. I've observed the surgery as a really radical approach, and it'll be well worth listening to his, his talk. Um, here's another question coming in from Christina. If we can put that up. Thank you. How many patients have has he, meaning Dr. J, seen with TOS, vascular TOS, without an additional rib? Very good. I was diagnosed with both, but I do not have an additional rib. Take it away. Uh, I'm not sure. She's saying she was diagnosed with an additional rib, doesn't have it? or I, I think she's saying she has been diagnosed with vascular TOS, but she doesn't have a cervical oh. rib. Oh, yeah. I mean, cervical ribs only make up 1% of TOS. It's a very rare subtype. That's great. This is part of this, what I deal with, with the docs who don't know TOS, who say it's disputed. If you have a cervical rib, you have TOS. That's as far as they know it. And that's easy. It saves space on the neurons. But it turns out in my experience and reading the literature and uh, Dr. J here, same thing. Uh, cervical rib is, it's about 0.2 to 0.5% of the general population. I've never seen a publication that shows a statistical correlation with TOS. We've seen lots of patients with TOS who don't have any cervical ribs. So I... I would not see a cervical rib on an x-ray and say that's TOS. And I wouldn't see TOS on an MRI and say it can't be TOS because there isn't a cervical rib. Correct. So for all of our viewers, T cervical TOS rib is, is easy, a diagnostic. Yeah. TOS is a diagnosis, not a radiologic finding. Thank you. That's right. By the way, I, when I do medical legal cases, I get asked, I just had one this week, when I find a bunch of extra muscles and some really tight spaces, the attorney will ask me, well, that's been there their whole life. So how do they have symptoms now after a car wreck? And I always go back to the clinician, right? There's always a history. If the patient had a car wreck and got out with pain going down both arms, reported it to the police officer, it doesn't matter. They had those extra muscles their whole life. This is when it showed up. So it's not just a radiologic finding. I agree totally. Well, it's also there's this concept called the brittle man theory, which says that you know, if you have brittle bones, but you're walking around fine and you don't have any problems at all, and somebody hits you and breaks your bones, they can't say, well, you had brittle bones. It's not my fault you, they broke just because I punched you. No, that doesn't wash. If, if you, even if you have a pre-existing condition, if the injury exacerbated it, that's causative. That's a linkage. It's a causal linkage between the two that not for this event, you wouldn't be symptomatic. Uh, it's like the I always say this, the breast cancer gene. There are women who have this gene and it increases their risk for getting breast cancer. But it's not 100 percent. It's a predisposition. You need another event or more to occur on top of that. So TOS, a lot of TOS is anatomic abnormalities that predispose, but they don't cause by itself. Right. Uh, Sally here says, uh, this is a good question, too. I've been told neurogenic TOS is a diagnosis of exclusion. If so, is this true? Is MRI used to rule out possible causes? I, I think we can both answer part of this because I have a lot to say on this. Now, go ahead. Well, first of all, I think that that's really selling radiology short. As much as we talk about use radiology properly, it's a great tool. It can show things that no other modality can show. And if you have a radiologist who's a doctor who just works with the images and he or she is willing to work with a good clinician, then they can accomplish a lot more than either one could on their own. I think um, 
in a lot of the literature written by vascular surgeons, they'll say this. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. And they've never looked at, as far as I know, a good MRI or even a good CAT scan. If a radiologist is good and he or she is dedicated and he or she listens and he or she understands the disease, he or she, as I do with my studies, can see a lot of things that cause TOS. That's my opinion. It's not a diagnosis of exclusion. And, and the flip side of that is on a clinical basis. Uh, so first of all, there are electrophysiologic tests that are positive in TOS that are not positive in other entities. Uh, and this is what I was saying with the SSCPs and MEPs, that we could do it on patients lifting their arms up and all of a sudden their SSCPs drop out. That is when you put it into the system of the, all this other symptoms they have, those are positive findings. They're not exclusionary findings. They are they are positive findings that correlate with the diagnosis. So it's not just a diagnosis of exclusion. Well, they don't have a disc herniation. I mean, I don't operate, I don't do a first rib resection on every patient who doesn't have X, Y, and Z. They also have to have positive reproduction. They have to have positive mm -hmm. findings that are also consistent with TOS, you know, That's just great. as I, I, please go. Sorry. No, that's fine. I, I, I was just going to say, it's also a mindset. If you just say, well, we're going to rule out the cervical spine and we'll rule out a rotator cuff and we'll rule out a metabolic neuropathy and we'll rule out toe fungus. That's a really bad approach to take for a disease where we can find the signs yeah. if we're looking for them, but there if you are don't know what to look finds. for. There are positive signs if you know what to look for. So yes, um, it, it, that is, I would not, I do not like calling that a, a diagnosis of exclusion because by that definition, you would literally have to do every single test known to man before you would ever treat TOS. Yeah. And maybe that's their <laughs> idea is they don't want to treat it. Maybe. Uh, a question from Christina. Can vascular TOS cause such severe compression as to cause syncope? Uh, like severe pressure in the neck and head when standing, uh, passenger in an airplane on ascending or descending. So c can you get headache and similar symptoms from TOS? Um, you probably have a different neurologic problem going on if that's going on um, that may be similar to TOS. Uh, I would worry about a couple of different things, but also it's not unusual to get syncope with other, you know, uh, there are a number of hypotension uh, conditions, um, or you could have thrombi, you know, blood clots going to your heart or to your brain causing those exact same symptoms. And those could be coming from a TOS problem, a VTOS or an ATOS, um, more like a V where you might have a patent frame in a valley, blood clots go out. So yes and no, uh, it's hard to say. And once again, this isn't the media to give a diagnosis. If you're asking possibilities, there are. Um, but I think this is where you really want to get a good neurologist to look you over and figure out if uh, what might be going on. And you might even need a cardiologist. That's right. So syncope has a full workup. It's something important to work up. Uh, cardiologist, neurologist, just as Dr. J said, in the literature, there's not a lot of association between syncope or fainting and TOS, but there is a relationship with headaches. It's kind of a different issue, right? if that helps. Um, additional question, I have severe cervical stenosis, dysautonomia. Um, you can read the question here. She's got a neuropathy already. It's hard to decide which symptoms match which diagnoses. Uh, I'm a mess. I'm sorry to hear you're feeling that way. Uh, possible Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which Dr. J talked about. And I found that a lot of this go hand in hand. Yes. So there's a lot going on there. And uh, the advice we gave before to uh, go some bells about um, hopefully you have a doc who's focusing on one or two things at a time. Um, certainly Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, yeah, has been uh, associated with TOS. But I think this is... Uh, this is a situation where you need to have a doc working with you to focus on things. Um, yeah, it sounds like you need to have that cervical spine looked at as well. I mean, that's that might be number one uh, on the list of things to do. And there are, I, I don't know the films, I don't know the story, I don't know the exam, I don't, so I can't comment one way or another. But there are some treatments that are 
shall we say, more Ehlers-Danlos friendly than others. If you don't have to do a fusion, for example, laminoplasty might be a good uh, first step in managing a patient with cervical myelopathy and multiple other neurologic and, and physiologic problems uh, because it's not a fusion procedure. So the healing is, uh, is a little better tolerated than if doing, say, a cervical laminectomy fusion. But I, having said that, there may be such severe instability that a fusion is absolutely de rigueur required. So once again, your mileage may vary, but um, I would at least ask the question. Uh, I'm going to take one more question here, Art, because our time, uh, we're using a lot of your time, and I greatly appreciate it. Uh, Ngaku, who asked this question before, asks if TUS can cause gait dysfunction. So generally, no. Um, are there circumstances where something could be associated with TOS and result in a gait disturbance? Yes. But it, I would be, if you were going to link the two, I would look to something higher up going back on that Occam's razor. Um, after all, uh, the only way that it would affect your gait is if your balance is a little bit off because your arms are, are weak. But most people walk just fine with even if they their arms were paralyzed. So it's uh, generally, I would say no, I would be looking. And, and as soon as I, and I always ask my patients, how's your balance? Always. I mean, you can't not get into, you can't get out of my office without that question. And more often than not, if you say, eh, it's not great, you're getting an MRI of your cervical spine. All right, please tell everybody again how we can, uh, how they can reach out to you and contact you through the website. Well, certainly please reach out to JenkinsNeurospine.com. Uh, there are uh, places that you can go for information. Uh, in addition, there's a way to register for an evaluation. Uh, we have a process for doing some free consults with one of my uh, practitioners uh, or uh, to see if you, it makes sense for you to speak with me or one of my other uh, uh, colleagues directly, either through telemedicine or in person. And uh, TOSeducation.org is a sponsor of these videos. They do a great job with this, getting great speakers like Dr. Jenkins. My website is TOSMRI.com. Uh, again, this is Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy. I want to thank everybody for attending and asking lots of great questions, and especially thanking Dr. Jenkins for his valuable time and his amazing expertise. So come back soon. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Always happy to share the, uh, the microphone with uh, a zealot, another zealot <laughs> in the area of trying to raise the bar for our patients. I'm fortunate. I'm very fortunate. Thank you, Art. All right. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Good luck to you and uh, be safe out there.